Hello, Polygoners! Little Birdie told me some of you guys wanted to know about Zerg vs. Protoss. In particular, the gateway timings and stuff that have been either shutting Zerg down completely right now on this patch, the players that are coming to me asking for help in the ladder, or they feel really hopeless in the mid game, like there's no way for them to win. And they're looking for options now this is part two of what's going to be a three-part series on zerg vs protoss in particular broodlords therefore why we're doing three parts it's just too much just to tackle in one video so i've small chunked everything into different pieces the first segment obviously was getting your initial infrastructure set up your economy getting and reading the scouting information and adapting your technology as you see fit this particular video um, is going to be less like restricted by what you scout as this is going to be pretty true of any um, any game regardless of composition there's going to be a phase in it wherein the Protoss is trying to amass their death ball and whether it's economically advantageous for you or not you as a Zerg player just have to trade, trade, trade to stop that death ball from happening while you're also transitioning into what you want to do in the late game. Being on top of your transitions is one of the most important things in this matchup. So if it's something you struggle with, hopefully this will be an exercise that will allow you to improve that element of your gameplay. Now, if you guys remember, Jim Rising had just established a fourth base. He was thinking about mining from that fourth base, but before he did so, he established what we were calling a mulligan base, which was basically a place for the Protoss to target that Gem Rising didn't really care if it died. He would still have production elsewhere. He would still have an economy elsewhere, but of course, if it stayed up, not only would it be good creep spread, it would be more production, and eventually it would be a mining base. And this draws the Protoss out onto the map to fight forcing him to trade a mostly gateway composition for what really only costed minerals and not even minerals that Jim Rising was that attached to. For this, he lost Stalkers, he lost Sentries, he lost Zealots, he used a warp in, and he lost the ability, most importantly, to attack the fourth base that was mining economically. So Jim Rising, by forcing his opponent to attack one place, was able to secure and defend a different place, the more important place. Now, while all that was happening over here at the fifth base, there was also a counterattack. So using the links he already had on the field, He's just sending in units to deal with what he already knows is an attack here. Does manage to get the kill on the cannon, but these adepts gonna clean up very nicely. Not the best move, but just imagine if those units had not been there. Little things like that can really add up, especially in your own games. And then of course this fifth, fifth base ends up falling. And the interesting part about the decision making of the Protoss here is that most Protoss in today's meta kill a base and then warp home. This mulligan base takes advantage of that in a very interesting way. Because warping home means the attack's over and there won't be an attack over here for a while. Had the attack been over here, he would have just, same thing, just in a different spot. Now behind this, we've got a bunch of drones being produced. The army was produced up until the attack was over. There's no reason to mix and match. You shouldn't be doing some drones and some army at any given point. Just full out production of workers or full out production of army, no in between. We also have some extractors being taken. We're gonna have plus four. There's one, here's about to be a second one, third and fourth. Now this is going to be getting ready for the lurker den that is going down, plus one range to getting started. This has already been started for a while. We've got another queen being made to replace the one we lost. Jim Rising is going to be launching his own attack. This Phoenix does scout it, but we also have the fifth base being built behind this now jim rising knows he won a very convincing victory there and he doesn't want to uh commit too heavily to this attack but he does want to keep the protoss army count down he knows it's weak right now and protoss is much much stronger when they are grouped up now this is a great concave by the hydralis as you can see a lot of the protoss army being stuck up there good blink though Meanwhile, the lings have got into this natural and are killing probes. Just a few probes have been killed so far, but this can get nasty very quickly. The army of the Protoss still dealing with the Hydras. You can see some very impressive zone control in this. And now 15 ling or 15 probes rather have been killed. So really awesome stuff here by Gem Rising, just in controlling the territory. 
Hello, Supernova. I don't know if anyone else has realized, but there is a stripper on this map. So that attack did have a lot of hydras being produced and some links, but there was mostly Hydra Drone. This is where you start doing a little bit of hybrid production, and that's gonna be up to the point you reach your around an 85 drone goal. So we've got the 83 drones, that's close enough, and of course, Jim knows he did a lot of economic damage by killing those probes. Once he's reached that goal, he's just gonna go Hydra Ling. He's getting the pneumatized carapace upgrade, definitely a good investment. But interestingly, he's also getting an overseer, and it's here at this natural base. This is gonna be really powerful scouting, both with the overseer, its inherent abilities, its inherent movement speed upgrade, not to mention the added movement speed upgrade of pneumatized carapace. And you can see that the Zuri is still being very offensive on the map. He's got good creep spread. Could be a little better through here but not that not that big a deal and we can see that the hydralisks are taking the zonaga tower now this is a really cool move here because this is a great place to launch an attack from he's got this base here so by being here he's kind of like intercepting where the protoss thinks the zerg should be or like where he's expanding to so this is kind of a defensive force and he's got some vision you know all of this area here Meanwhile, he's morphing in his lurkers to get ready for an attack, and this will force the Protoss most likely into disruptors. And he'll be upgrading, or building some more gases so that he can continue with his upgrades and better technological, technological units. We're also going to be seeing an infestation hit here in about 10 seconds, which is going to allow him to start working towards Hive eventually. And now we got those lurkers completing. We've got a lot of hydras and lings on the floor. He is gonna get his lings wrapped around, get those lurkers up underneath them. Very nice, very nice. And see how this is more of like a defensive cleanup sweeping force? You can almost think of it like in a giant eraser. And the lurkers getting into a good position. Disruptors are on the field, but no observers just yet. And he's going to be mounting an attack behind this. Now, the infestation pit we talked about, we're going to be completing here in a moment. More hydralisks in production, more lurkers, of course, being morphed. And we've got the plus two arranged upgrade on route. He does have a second evolution chamber. We will be getting the plus two melee upgrade here eventually. And really, the goal of this phase of the game is just to start trading. At this point, upgrades are going higher techs on route, well on the way to high. This is the part of the game where you have to prevent or delay the Protoss from amassing the dreaded death ball. Trading's always to your advantage during this phase, even disadvantageous trading where you're not getting your money's worth or your opponent's getting a more economic advantage than you. It's just important in this matchup that you are preventing that death ball from building up, even if it costs you economically. This will also allow you to know your opponent's tech situation, both upgrades and units. And he's only grouping down like two or three lurkers at any given location. This is really awesome. It helps uh, deal with some of those disruptor balls. Well, maybe a little too close to those cannons though. Colossi do a great job taking out um, lurkers that have kind of been left on their own. But what Jim Rising is trying to do here is wedge Paco Mike into this position here. We saw him use this position previously to get some uh, probe kills here. Watch how he uses this position again here in a moment. He's got his Hydras here, Ling Hydra coming in here. He's got two Lurkers set up right here. If Protoss comes down, Lurkers are going to be coming in and attacking him. So he's opened up the floodgates for this Hydra Ling army. Now, Hydra Ling going to be breaking in at the natural. A couple of them getting distracted over here, not that big a deal. Mostly the Lurkers are dealing with this army. And Jim Rising's just using this small contingent of units to pull them straight into the lurker shots. If they're dealing with the lurkers and the small contingent of units, this contingent of units will be able to get in here and do economic damage. None of this army is really intended to survive, to be honest with you. This is a throwaway army, a tradeaway army. But if he can get some really good tech off of this by killing off Colossi or Disruptors, why not? That's exactly what he's trying to do. Good pickup on that Colossi there. And as you can see, Lurkers will get cleaned up, but looks like he'll get one more kill. Maybe, maybe, possibly. Not quite so much. Now you can see a lot of these units are going to be retreating. 
And one thing Jim Rising was not able to scalp is this fourth base. It's a little bit of a narrow hindsight for him, but he is going to make remedy of that with these Lings. Lings definitely something that can be thrown away. He's just going to work on some more defensive stuff here with these Hydralisks. But notice these 14 Lings. They're set up in a great position, always on the like outskirts of where you think your opponent's going to be so that you get a moment to control it, make sure everything's grouped up. He swings in here, sees the Photon Cannon, and this is awesome. He just parks these... Lings, because he knows if he goes and tries to deal with this, A, it's not the, got the greatest surface area, B, this is going to show up before he can kill this, so this is the, the easy target. Blinks in, sees the Colossi, going to save what he can. And this is really cool, really interesting. He's just going to leave these here for a while. Meanwhile, we do have a six base being taken, and as you can see, he's starting to work his way down here in this cluster format we were talking about. And we're finally starting to see... Plus one ground carapace, now some adrenal glands, ultralis cavern, starting to see a bunch of lings, and some banelings getting morphed in. These are going to be banelings. This is awesome. So we've got banelings morphing down here, and we've got hydralisks attacking up here. Ideally, we're going to see an attack right here with the hydralisks, pulling this army this way, and then swing in here and clean this up. It's not actually going to be worked out uh, perfectly, the timing on this, but it could have been. As you can see, he is retreating back a little bit. So he attacked a little prematurely. And this army is able to swing back down here. And is already in a great position to deal with this. A little bit slow. Imagine if that Hydralisk attack had have come just a little bit earlier. However, after trying to do that, he swings back in here with a Ling Force. And again, this army is pretty much able to deal with it. So that's a little bit of a mistake by Jim Rising. Great player, but everyone's human. So we got this Spire around 12 minutes, and we're gonna be seeing Kitness Plating coming up uh, uh, very shortly, followed by Ultralisks, followed by Burrow and Pathogen Glands. So what you'll notice is that even before Kitness Plating, which typically you get the upgrade before the units, we are going to have Ultralisks started. This is counter meta. Um, Burrow, of course, going to help Infestors a huge amount. We also have the Pathogen Glands upgrade, definitely indicating Infestors. So again, getting the Ultralisks before the Infestors as well. And plus two gas. So at this point, we've got gases on pretty much every base. As you can see, as we get into the late game, gas is becoming really important. And we want to stick on around 85 to 90 workers. So we got a handful of drones coming in, but nothing too major. Small little engagement right here. And we do see the plus three melee attack upgrades coming through. Ultralisks will allow you to be really offensive with your links because they provide a meat shield for the Hydralisks. So as you'll see, a lot of links have been in production. We saw the 40 just not too long ago, not to mention a whole bunch more now. So at this stage in the game, where we've had these Hydralisks kind of like swooping back and forth in a defensive capacity the last few minutes, when they weren't like attacking here they've really just run this gamut which is really cool now they'll have the ultralisks there as a meat shield and the links can be a lot more aggressive and offensive and in your face cracklings do that for you links on the other hand not the best of defense especially their zealots still cleaning up really nicely with the crackling upgrade got an attack here at the, the fifth base And we got the Greater Spire starting, as well as Neural Parasites. Of course, this is definitely looking Infestor Brood Lordish. And the interesting part here is we only have five Corruptors being made by a Zerg. There's a couple of reasons for this. Mostly, it's a lack of supply. But if you want to know the major reason, you're going to have to check back in a couple of days when we release part three of this series, because this is going to wrap up our lesson on trading and transitioning. But when we release part number three, that is going to be covering the final chapter of this saga, how to employ brood lords, how to use them on the map, and what techniques are there 
What tactics are there out there to help you keep them alive to get the result that you want in your own games? That's going to be what we're covering in part number three. I hope you guys liked this video. Hope you'll share it with your friends. Definitely recommend this to newer players who are struggling to see how StarCrafts, all their individual pieces, fit together into one larger whole. That was the point of breaking this down into three different segments is so that I could go into super great detail to show newer players like all these little nuanced things that don't really seem to matter in isolation end up crafting the entire theme of a given match and I think that that is very significant both for us to understand and for newer players to learn. If you like what we are trying to do here on this channel, please visit us on Patreon Link is in the description, but patreon.com slash polygon se2. Every dollar counts, every little bit helps. If you want to see more freeform content like we produce here, that is the place to support us. If you have any suggestions on video topics or titles or anything else, please leave them in the comment section below. I am running out of topics. I want to compile another list to get you guys exactly what you want to see before I start producing what just strikes my fancy so if there's something important to you please let me know about it i will make it happen until then guys i am shaft with polygon gaming thank you so much for watching and i'll see you next time chatelet my dudes if you want to be notified when we release videos like this, please make sure you hit the subscribe button. If you don't know where that is, I'm not going to teach you how to use the internet. There's probably no hope for you.